Hello, welcome to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, and I will be your host for this web series. The purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize. Athletes get Olympic gold medals, chefs get Michelin stars, actors get Oscars, musicians get Grammys, writers get Pulitzers, and scientists get Nobel Prizes. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to treat diseases. Today, we will be examining the 1966 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which was awarded to Peyton Rouse and Charles Huggins. I've decided to split the 1966 Nobel Prize into two episodes. Today we'll focus on Rouse's Nobel Prize, and we'll come back to Huggins after we've finished covering the Nobel Prizes awarded for research in infectious diseases. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Rouse the award, quote, for his discovery of tumor-inducing viruses, unquote. We'll go over Rouse's discovery of a chicken virus that caused cancer, how that sparked a search for cancer-causing viruses in humans, and we'll focus specifically on Epstein-Barr virus and its role in human diseases. But first, a little bit about Rouse's background. Rouse was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 1879 and was educated at John Hopkins University. He obtained a bachelor's degree in 1900 and a medical degree from the same university in 1905. After graduating medical school, he chose to go into medical research rather than medical practice. He got a job as an instructor in pathology at the University of Michigan, but then was able to secure a research position at the Rockefeller Institute in New York City in 1909. He would remain at Rockefeller for the rest of his career, and it was there that he would make his Nobel Prize winning cancer discovery. So what was known about cancer back in Rouse's day? Well, cancer was known since ancient times. There's a very interesting description of cancer from a 4,000-year-old ancient Egyptian medical text, which appears along with the description, no known treatment. For most of human history, that's about as far as the understanding of cancer would go, a simple description of the tumors and nothing anyone could do to stop the tumor's growth. But since the outcome of cancer was death, there was a great deal of interest in understanding the disease, as well as finding a cure. With the development of microscopes, scientists could see that cancer was a disease of our own bodies. Tumors form when a person's cells begin replicating uncontrollably. In the process, the cells will often take on a new appearance under the microscope and develop properties that allow them to outcompete healthy cells for nutrients. It became clear that to treat cancer, the cancer cells would have to be removed before they completely overwhelmed the healthy cells. The most straightforward approach to address this problem was through surgery. The second half of the 19th century saw a steep rise in cancer surgery, which corresponded with the development of anesthesia. Doctors could now cut out tumors while patients were under anesthesia, and many surgeries were helping in the fight against cancer. But cancer patients would often relapse after surgery, and cancer deaths continued to rise in the late 19th century and 20th century. There was growing agreement among scientists that if new advancements in cancer treatments were to be developed, an understanding about what caused cancer would first have to be reached. Unfortunately, nobody could agree about what caused cancer. There was this assumption that cancer had a single cause, and so as soon as that single cause could be identified, the cure for cancer could be developed. But people were having trouble identifying what that single cause might be, though they had dismissed a lot of the old superstitious ideas. As one news reporter in the 20th century jokingly put it, quote, While we don't know the causes of most cancers, we do know what doesn't cause it. Cancer is not caused by tomatoes tight corsets, a punch on the nose, eating meat, making love, or lying on the ground in whales." But then around the end of the 19th century, scientists began making great strides in one particular area of biology, infectious diseases. 
It was becoming more and more apparent that microorganisms were responsible for a wide range of human diseases, from the malaria parasite to the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, and eventually to viruses like yellow fever virus. As microorganisms became implicated in more and more human diseases, scientists began to wonder if microbes might also be the cause of cancer. And it's at this point that Rouse announced his discovery of a cancer-causing virus. Rouse's discovery of the Rouse sarcoma virus begins with another one of those serendipitous events all too common in the biological sciences. One day in 1910, while Rouse was working at Rockefeller, a farmer from Long Island arrived at his lab with a sick chicken. The chicken had a lump on its breast that Rouse identified as a sarcoma, a cancer of connective tissues. To determine if the tumor really was cancerous, Rouse performed the basic test of transferring some tumor cells from the sick chicken to healthy chickens. If the tumor really was cancerous, the implanted cells would grow to form new tumors, and sure enough, they did. Rouse then did something that he really didn't expect to work. Viruses had recently been discovered, first in plants and then in animals, and then as agents of human disease. Viruses could be separated from cells in infected tissue by passing the cells through a filter with holes big enough for the virus to pass through, but small enough to prevent cells from passing through. With this new filter technique available, some scientists had hypothesized that viruses might be the cause of cancer in animals. Experiments were tried using the filtered tumors of dogs, mice, and rats, but to the disappointment of the scientists, the filtrate was unable to induce tumors when injected into fresh hosts. Rouse decided to try the same experiment with his chickens, expecting to get the same result that had been observed with the mammalian tumors. To his surprise, injecting the tumor filtrate into healthy chickens produced fresh tumors. This meant there was something small, smaller than the cancer cells, that was present in the tumors, and this thing, whatever it was, could turn healthy cells into cancerous cells. Rouse found he could continuously passage this cancer-causing agent from one chicken to another, meaning the cancer-causing substance was replicating inside the chicken. Rouse published his findings in 1911 in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, writing that the cancer-causing substance was likely a, quote, ultramicroscopic organism, unquote, which was an early term for viruses. The virus was later named Rouse sarcoma virus in his honor, and the discovery ignited a huge burst of interest in virology and cancer. For decades, people searched for the virus that was the cause of human cancers. However, after years and years of work, no cancer-causing human virus was observed. It wasn't until 1964, over 50 years after the discovery of the Rouse sarcoma virus, that a virus called the Epstein-Barr virus was discovered and linked to childhood lymphomas. The discovery of the Epstein-Barr virus and its cancer-causing effects ignited new interest in the virus theory of cancer, and as interest grew, so did interest in the Rouse sarcoma virus, the first virus shown to cause cancer. This interest in cancer-causing viruses eventually gained the attention of the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, and in 1966, Rouse was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So where are we at nowadays with the Rouse sarcoma virus? Well, very often in science, once a scientist finds an answer to a question, it just creates more questions. In Rouse's case, his question was, why does this chicken have a tumor? And the answer to that question was, the chicken has a cancer-causing virus. That answer created a ton of other questions, including the question, how exactly does the Rouse sarcoma virus cause cancer? Well, the search for the answer to that question would result in two more Nobel Prizes, so stay tuned, we're going to be spending a couple more episodes on the Rouse sarcoma virus, and spoilers, we'll see that the Rouse sarcoma virus has some features that have profoundly shaped our understanding of medicine and the biological sciences. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's set Rouse sarcoma virus aside for the time being. What about viruses that cause cancer in humans? Where are we at with those nowadays? Well, viruses turned out to not be the single underlying cause of human cancers. 
It turns out there are plenty of other carcinogens out there that can induce the formation of cancer cells, and viruses are just one piece of the puzzle. Nevertheless, viruses remain a significant contributing factor to human cancers, and it's estimated that 15% of new cancer cases each year are caused by viruses. There has been a lot of progress in understanding the cancer-causing viruses, or to give them their proper name, the oncoviruses. You may have heard the term oncology before, or seen an oncology ward at a hospital. Oncology is the study of cancer. It comes from the Greek word onkos, which means bulk or mass, which is a reference to the masses of tumor cells found in the cancer patient. So an oncovirus is a virus that causes tumors, that causes cancer. Since the identification of Epstein-Barr virus, several other human oncoviruses have been discovered. These include hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and human papillomaviruses. Now, hep A, hep B, and HPV are all associated with their own Nobel Prizes, so we won't be focusing on those viruses today either. Again, stay tuned for later episodes. Instead, we'll wrap things up today with a closer look at Epstein-Barr virus, the first human oncovirus to be discovered. The story of the Epstein-Barr virus starts in the 1950s with a man named Dennis Burkitt. Burkitt was an Irish surgeon who joined the Royal Army Medical Corps during World War II. His military service resulted in his being stationed in Africa for the duration of the war. Burkitt was also a devout evangelical Christian, and with the conclusion of World War II, he felt God's call to stay in Africa to continue meeting the medical needs of the people there. He would spend a good part of the next two decades working as a surgeon in Uganda. During this time, he would regularly see children in his clinic suffering from a previously undescribed cancer. The children were usually under the age of 12 and had massive swellings in their face and abdomens, which would unfortunately invariably result in the deaths of the children. The cancer turned out to be a type of lymphoma, a cancer of white blood cells. Specifically, it was a cancer of B cells, the cells responsible for making antibodies. As Burkitt and his colleagues began tracing the epidemiology of the disease, they noticed that the disease had a unique distribution. Cases of Burkitt's lymphoma were most common in warm, tropical regions of Africa. This distribution was similar to other tropical diseases like yellow fever and malaria, which were known to be infectious diseases caused by pathogens. This raised the possibility in the minds of several scientists that Burkitt's lymphoma might be caused by a pathogen. One of these scientists was a man named Anthony Epstein. In March of 1961, Burkitt traveled to London and gave a lecture about his newly described cancer. One of the attendees in his lecture was a young scientist named Anthony Epstein. Epstein was an assistant pathologist working at Middlesex Hospital in London. He was also very interested in the viral origins of cancer, and he had been working for many years with Rouse sarcoma virus in chickens. After hearing Burkitt's lecture, Epstein decided to change his focus from chickens to humans. Believing that Burkitt's lymphoma might be caused by a virus, he arranged with Burkitt to have some tumor samples shipped from Uganda to London. Epstein was able to grow the cells in his lab and examine them with the help of his research assistants, Yvonne Barr and Bert Ekong. The trio used a newly developed microscopy technique called the electron microscope to examine the tumor cells. While standard light microscopes are unable to see objects as small as viruses, electron microscopes are powerful enough to visualize viruses. When Epstein looked at the tumor cells under the microscope, lo and behold, they were infected with a virus. The group published their results in the journal The Lancet in 1964. The news received a lot of attention, and the virus was named the Epstein-Barr virus after its discoverers. However, the presence of Epstein-Barr virus in the tumors was not evidence that the virus caused the tumors. After all, correlation does not equal causation. Sure, maybe the virus was causing the cells to become cancerous, or maybe Burkitt's lymphoma cells, after they became cancerous, were just more susceptible to infection with the virus. So more experiments needed to be done to piece this out. 
Evidence for a causal link between Epstein-Barr virus and cancer came from the American married couple Werner and Gertrude Henley in 1968, who were working at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. The couple were able to grow normal non-cancer lymphocyte cells in flasks. They took those healthy cells and checked to see if they became cancerous when infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Sure enough, infection with the virus was able to induce some of the cells to become cancerous. Pretty cool, right? Here's where things get complicated, though. When researchers went to do epidemiological studies of Epstein-Barr virus, they found that a staggering proportion of people have Epstein-Barr virus infections. Epstein-Barr belongs to a family of viruses called herpes viruses, and like other herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr causes latent infections, so once you're infected, you're infected for life. Over half of children in developed countries are infected with the virus by the time they're four years old, and 95% of the world's adult population is currently infected with Epstein-Barr virus. So if you're listening to this podcast, odds are you have the virus. So here's the weird thing. There are only about 200,000 new cancer cases arising from Epstein-Barr virus infections each year. So if there are so many people infected with Epstein-Barr virus, why isn't everyone developing Burkitt's lymphoma? Well, scientists hypothesize that while Epstein-Barr virus is indeed responsible for Burkitt's lymphoma, there needs to be secondary factors present in addition to the virus that can trigger cancer formation. In the absence of these secondary factors, a person can still get infected with Epstein-Barr virus, but won't develop cancer. What these secondary factors are is currently unknown, but they are likely unique genetic or environmental factors, and scientists are still working to get a better understanding of how exactly Epstein-Barr virus can trigger cancer. Once it became apparent that Epstein-Barr virus was an incredibly common pathogen, scientists began to wonder if Epstein-Barr was associated with other diseases, not just cancer. Most cases of Epstein-Barr virus infection in children are asymptomatic, though they can sometimes result in cold-like symptoms. In adults, Epstein-Barr virus infection causes the disease mononucleosis, or mono for short. Mono is sometimes called the kissing disease because the virus is spread by contact with human saliva. Symptoms of mono include fever, fatigue, and sore throat, but the disease usually resolves in a few weeks. While it's annoying to get, mononucleosis is not a fatal disease, so efforts to control Epstein-Barr virus have been negligible. Recently, however, Epstein-Barr virus has been the subject of renewed interest among scientists because of its possible link with multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, or MS, is an autoimmune disease that affects about 2 million people globally and is responsible for about 18,000 deaths each year. A strong correlation between infection with Epstein-Barr virus and multiple sclerosis has been established, though definitive proof has yet to be presented. Just like with Burkitt's lymphoma, it's still a mystery why only a small fraction of people who are infected with Epstein-Barr virus would develop MS. Scientists are still trying to figure out what other secondary factors may play a role in the development of MS, but the idea that protecting people from Epstein-Barr virus could also prevent them from developing MS is certainly appealing, especially because treatment for MS is pretty limited right now. Progress has been slow in combating Epstein-Barr virus infections. There is currently no known way of eliminating Epstein-Barr virus latent infections from a person. For most people, though, the presence of the virus will go unnoticed, and they will live their lives totally oblivious to its presence. However, because Epstein-Barr virus plays a role in several diseases, including mono, Burkitt's lymphoma, and possibly MS, it would be nice if we had a way to prevent Epstein-Barr virus infection. Unfortunately, vaccine development against Epstein-Barr virus has been slow. There is currently no approved vaccine for Epstein-Barr virus. The vaccines that have been tried so far have not been able to prevent infection, though they did lower rates of mono. Recently, however, the biotech company Moderna, newly famous for their mRNA vaccine targeting SARS-CoV-2, has started a phase 1 clinical trial of an mRNA vaccine against Epstein-Barr virus. 
It's possible this new vaccine may also be unable to prevent infection with Epstein-Barr virus, but if it can effectively prevent mono or MS or Burkitt's lymphoma, that would be a huge achievement. It will probably take a long time though before we know if this new vaccine can prevent those diseases, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Well, that concludes this episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on March 2nd, 2022. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. And next time on Notable Nobels, we will be continuing to talk about viruses and cancer and going into more detail about the Rouse sarcoma virus. After the discovery of the Rouse sarcoma virus, many questions remained about how exactly the virus caused cancer. What was the virus doing to the cells that caused them to become cancerous? What molecules were involved in the change from normal cell to cancer cell? Well, the answer to those questions was worth its own Nobel Prize. Want to know more? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.